Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena. In this week's video, we'll tell you why we've gotten up at 5.30 in the morning today and why we're gonna be driving two and a half hours to see some cork trees. And then a little bit later in the video, we should start heading south again. Everything is packed, we're ready to go. So let's head off and see if our rental car is still where we left it yesterday. Welcome to the Cork Tree Express. Doo -doo. <laughs> my name is Mess, this is my wife, Ava. I've spent the last five years on a somewhat extensive refit of our 1987 Warrior 38 named Athena. That was a DIY fun-packed adventure complete with a very extensive osmosis treatment, building a new rudder using vacuum infusion, rebuilding the entire deck, gutting and subsequently rebuilding most of the interior, painting the top sides and a ton of other projects. The summer of 2021, we started cruising full time. Now we're finally ready to begin our adventure. We're about an hour outside of Lisbon now and we have another hour and a half to go. We're gonna do something a little different on Sail Life this week. We're gonna get a little bit personal, but you guys are probably wondering why something so silly as a cork tree is so important to me. But in a lot of ways, I would not be here or with Mads without them. I will try not to cry, but I cannot make any promises. But to understand the full story, we have to go all the way back to wee little Ava, who was growing up in Michigan in a trailer park. And for those who live outside of the US, there's a certain stigma associated with living in a trailer park. And I don't want to uphold the stigma, but for an admittedly hilarious reference, check out the show Trailer Park Boys. I now know that there's absolutely nothing wrong with growing up in a trailer, well, besides their tendency to get swept away in tornadoes, but my parents worked extremely hard to give us everything we could have ever needed or wanted, and that is including a My Size Barbie and a Sega Genesis all in one Christmas. So, yeah, we were pretty lucky. Unfortunately, as you do in adolescence, I let outside influences and stereotypes like the infamous trailer trash dictate my self-worth, and that actually had a profound effect on my childhood. I was more concerned with what people thought of me and less concerned about more important things like my schoolwork. For instance, I am probably the only person in history to have failed a photography class, and that is 100% true. But I had this weird skewed belief that education and intelligence were reserved for a very select few, those who were born with it, which I was not, and those who could afford to pay for it, which I certainly could not. Hang in there. We're getting closer to the cork cheese physically, and we're getting closer to how the cork cheese relate to this story. We are only a few kilometers away from the cork farm, but I wanted to finish my story real quick. So at this point, we are fast forward a few years and I am living in Los Angeles. I changed my hair, my clothes, and the way I talked all in the hopes of tricking people into believing I was no longer the little girl from the trailer park. But I don't think I've ever really rid myself of my Midwestern accent, you know? I was 24, I was exhausted and pretty much unrecognized at this point in my life, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing my glasses, and I had a long resume filled with lots of dead-end jobs. And I should also mention that at this point in time, I was probably spending too much time and money seeing a psychic, but I think that just shows how maybe gullible I was at the time, but also how desperate I was for any answers to show me what to do with my life. Then one day when I was nothing but a clump of Forever 21 clothes and tears on the floor, someone Someone very near and dear to me who know exactly who they are helped to change my life forever. They told me that yes, even little girls from trailer parks are smart and can go to school and despite what the negative thoughts and even what my psychic told me, I had the ability to change my own life. So admitting defeat, I decided to change my own life and that following semester I enrolled in classes at Los Angeles Valley College. Woo woo, go monarchs! And that is when we finally get to the cork trees. And there just happens to be one right here. When I started school, I had to start from the very beginning. And most students who enter college enroll in English 101, except I had to enroll in English 28, which was the class with students where 
English was their second language. So yeah, I was starting from the very beginning. It was in that class with Professor Laverne Rossau, who I initially bonded with over our mutual love of scarves, where my life was changed forever. She assigned us a research project where we had to choose a tree on campus, and I randomly chose the cork tree, and that was it. I dove headfirst into the assignment and did not look back. I know it seems like such a silly little treat, but for me, it just means so much more than that. It taught me how to learn, it taught me how to research, and it taught me how to see the beauty in such a seemingly simple thing. But most importantly, it taught me that I could do so much more than I thought I was ever capable of doing. If you would have told Valley College Ava that she would one day be in Portugal next to a cork tree with a master's degree with her Danish husband, living on a sailboat, she would not have been able to comprehend it. I can't even most days, but here I am. And that is why I love cork trees and why I love Mads in our life, because we are doing something that at one point we thought was impossible. And standing here next to this beautiful Quirka Suber, I can't help but think that if it is possible for this trailer trash, then it is possible for anyone. Ava had found a company called Cork Trekking, which offers tours of a real working farm with a vineyard, cattle, and most importantly, of course, cork trees. The tour of the farm lasted about two hours and included a lot of information about harvesting cork. For instance, we learned that the numbers on the trees represents when they were last harvested, and that on average, it takes around 10 to 12 years between harvests. Ava also got the chance to get up close and fondle lots of different cork. A 10 out of 10 excursion to mark the end of our stay in Lisbon. In last week's video I mentioned that we might have a weather window to go to the Canaries this week or possibly Madeira. But neither of those have really panned out. There's a bunch of nasty stuff rolling in from the west. So yeah, we can't do that. But what we can do is make our way from Lisbon, where we are right now, and down to this southern pointy end here down by Lagos. That's going to be three day jumps for us. And uh, today is going to be a short one. Why not just go straight to Lagos, you might ask? Well, because of the orcas. This entire area south of us has been very active over the last month or so. We're up here and we want to go down here. These blue dots are orca interactions and also observations. So you can see this little bay here south of us is pretty much a hot spot. Instead of making a jump straight across the bay here, we're going to have to hug the coast. And that means it is a little bit far to get down to Cenus in one day. So that's why today we're only going to this place up here. so much. Fair Thank you. We'll see you guys see you in the further the south. After having said goodbye to some new friends, we made a quick stop at the reception dock to pay the 646 euros for our 17 day stay. This is the most expensive marina we've encountered in Portugal. So long, cash cash. Bye bye. Which we just learned yesterday, the day before we left that it's pronounced cash cash. With an ash at the end. Yeah, and not cash cash. Yeah. We've not been saying the right thing. No, but better late than never. Yeah. <gasps> it's a beautiful day. The sun is up. There's not a lot of wind. So of course we're going to be motor sailing, but we're about to put the main up and that should help a little bit. Looks like the main's giving us about an extra half a knot. Woohoo, what are we going now? Uh, about six and a half. Oh yeah. We have about 30 miles to go and Let's be honest, we can probably sustain about five knots, so... Yeah, just to be on the safe side. Yeah, we have six hours of sailing today. Yep. We just rounded the point of Cabo Especial, I think that it's called, but it is just incredible here. This is one of the times where the view is just so idyllic that I hope we can capture it on camera. Mads is trying to right now, but the cliffs are just like so intense and steep and the waves crashing up against the rock. And there's like 
a little picturesque lighthouse at the top. It is just really beautiful and we feel very lucky to be out here right now. But we have six miles to go, the sun is out and it's going great. With the anchor firmly dug into the sandy bottom, we turned on the barbecue and enjoyed a very traditional Portuguese dinner of hot dogs before settling in for the night. Good morning, guys. We had a somewhat rocky night here at the anchorage, not because of the sea state, but because there's a bunch of fishing boats around here and when they come and leave, they make a little bit of a wake. The sun is starting to peek up over the horizon here behind me. And like I said, it is a really beautiful morning. Today we have about 40, 45 miles to do to Cenus. We left Lisbon up here yesterday, motored along the coast, spent the night here. And today we're going down to Cenus. And as you can see, we are still very much hugging the coast. It would of course be a lot shorter for us to cut across this little bay here, but the orcas seem to prefer slightly deeper water. So by hugging the coast, we should have less of a chance of getting attacked. Anchors up. There's a little bit of mud or sand on the anchor, so we're just gonna drag it through the water for a little bit to clean it. It's turned into a cold and rainy day out here in the middle of nowhere. We have a little over 14 miles to go and we should be in around 3 in the afternoon. Earlier today we had a lot of those fishing marker buoy thingies in the water that we had to snake our way through. And the little masthead camera actually turned out to be really useful for that. We have a camera at the very top of the mast, that's the one you just saw. And then there's one on the bottom spreaders. The one on the bottom spreaders is facing aft. The next time I'm up the mast, I think I'm gonna turn that around so that also is pointing forward because the one at the top of the mast is in portrait mode and the one on the bottom spreaders is in landscape mode. And I think it's nice to have both looking forward. We're now about four miles from the marina and as predicted, the wind has picked up. Now we're heading straight into it, so it seems like it's worse than it really is. The true wind speed, which is what the wind is actually blowing, is 15. And the apparent wind speed, which is what it feels like on the boat right now, is about 20, 21 knots. This isn't really a lot of wind. It just feels like a little bit more than it is because the wind is cold. But uh, yeah, I really, really hope the wind is not gonna mess up our maneuvering inside of the marina. It might get a little bit embarrassing, but uh, we'll throw a couple of GoPros up and uh, you guys will see if we mess up. Coming into Cenas, we got the waves right on our beam, causing the boat to roll a bit. To be able to put out fenders in calmer conditions, we ducked behind the breakwater. That also gave us a chance to wipe the rain off the GoPros before continuing on to the marina. Upon entering the marina, the very nice marina lady gestured for us to make our way to one of the berths on the inside. That meant getting the wind on the port aft side of the hull. The wind kept us from swinging all the way around in time. We reversed back out and came into a berth on the other side. That meant we had a long straight approach and that we were also coming up into the wind, which is much easier. Our stay in Cenas was short, but we did have time to take in the generous amount of seagull poop on the pontoons, as well as say hello to some of the locals, like this super cute young fellow, as well as this <clears throat> very tired, slightly older guy. Good morning, guys. It is six o'clock in the morning and we're ready for the long 65 mile push towards Lagos today. We won't get all the way there. We'll do 65 miles anchor and then do the last, I think it's 30 miles or something like that tomorrow. Now, even though it's only 65 miles, we're not gonna be able to start in daylight and finish in daylight, which is a little bit problematic with all of the fishing nets. The sun is just barely starting to come up here behind me and uh, yeah, we better get underway as soon as possible.
We got a little bit lucky this morning. We got a few hours of unexpectedly nice windy weather and that meant we were able to put up the sails and do seven knots versus five and a half under engine. So that's put us a little bit ahead of schedule. That means we should be getting to the anchorage just as the sun is setting. When we had the sails up, I was very tempted to bust out the wind vane and start playing with that. But in case we get attacked by orcas, which is not that far-fetched, there was an attack outside of Zenus while we were there. And this morning there was one up by Sisimbra, which was the first stop we had after we left Lisbon. But yeah, if there is an attack while we've got the rudder for the wind vane attached, I'm pretty sure the orca is going to destroy both of the rudders, leaving us with no backup rudder, which is one of the big upsides to this wind vane design. So until we're clear of orca territory, I I'd better hold off playing with the wind vane. This morning we left Cenus and we've been, as you can see, hugging the coast all day up until now. And we are only about 10 miles from our anchorage. This anchorage right here is the one we're aiming for. Now the sea state does look like it's a little bit more southerly than it was supposed to be. So I think this one might be a little bit too rolly, but we do have a second option right up here. That's only about 1.5 miles further. There are many things I love about Portugal. The dramatic coastline is high up on that list. I could watch the waves crashing against the cliffs for hours and not be bored. Although I would never be this close if it wasn't for the orcas. We got into the small little fishing village slash anchorage here last night. It had already gotten dark when we got in here. So picking up a mooring ball was a little bit of a struggle. It's not an official mooring ball you can pick up. It was just on Navali. I saw some comments saying that they'd used a yellow mooring ball and that the owner didn't seem to mind that sometimes he would come out and ask for a bit of money. So we tried finding the yellow mooring ball, but there were more than one yellow mooring ball. So we just picked one and uh, yeah, fortunately we didn't get chased off. What's not so fortunate is the fact that this is probably the most uncomfortable night we've spent at anchor. The sea state has calmed down a bit now, so it's not as rolly as it was during the middle of the night, but Jesus, this was a bumpy ride. This morning, we only have another 15 miles to go to Lagos, and that's where we're gonna be waiting until we get a weather window for the Canaries. After about three hours, we had made it to the entrance into Lagos. Something that we have noticed at multiple marinas here in Portugal is that they'll have a reception pontoon where you're supposed to tie up first before you get assigned a berth. It seems like a slightly annoying arrangement as tying up is the least fun part of boating. Anywho, eventually we made it through the copious amounts of paperwork and were allowed to proceed through the bridge to our home for the next roughly 10 days. By all accounts, that's going to be 10 pretty miserable days in terms of weather. It's basically going to be raining non-stop and there is absolutely no weather window in sight for us to go to the Canaries. The only reason I'm saying 10 days is because that's the maximum availability they had here in the marina and once those 10 days are up I think we'll go to either Anchor or one of the other marinas. We're currently at the very most southern tip of Portugal right here and we want to go to the Canary Islands so in this direction but if you look at all the stuff that just keeps rolling in from out west it's all giving us south southwesterly winds which is absolutely the wrong direction for going to the canaries so if you wouldn't mind we would very much appreciate some crossed fingers for a change in weather yes. very soon yeah. Now, in terms of next week, I have some minor projects that I need to get buttoned up, like the locks on the companionway steps. We've received mm -hmm. our emergency manual water maker. I want to show you guys that. But uh, after we've done that, I don't really know what we'll do. We'll figure something out. <laughs> yeah. So uh, either way, we hope to see you guys back here at Port Athena next week for yet more DIY fun. Mm -hmm. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. See, see you. you.